How awkward. Okay. Um, welcome. Um, just doing a little bit of... Well, I think I might actually reverse the order from what I listed. Uh, I'm going to start by doing my blades prep. And then if we have time, if there is still time, I'll go over a little bit of stuff for Girl by Moonlight, uh, which is my Blades in the Dark hack that I am midway through designing. Midway is generous, but... Okay, so let's actually start with um, Blades Prep stuff. Um, so, uh, I just wanted to show kind of the behind the scenes stuff for, uh, for blades and show like what my prep looks like and how all that functions. Um, so, I mean, here's our, our clocks page that we're used to seeing. Um, but then I also have in my roll 20 thing or do here, I also have my, my GM clocks, uh, which only I get to see. Um, and some stuff has resolved as of last week's episode. So this is the inspectors. They had a clock to gather enough evidence to put Rubik's away, which they did, but then Crow took the fall. So this one is done. Um, and I'm not sure what the inspectors are going to get up to next, so we'll come back to that. I just kind of want to clean up any stuff. So uh, the other things that are underway, the red sashes um, have put out a new drug, uh, and they're trying to compete with the hive for the drug trade. Um, unfortunately, the hive already dominates the contraband market, and they were, were able to uh, essentially uh, bribe the blue coats to take out, to just like lock down Tangletown, which is where the red sashes were bringing in their drugs by. Um, so people can't get any more of their stuff. And um, a couple people in Thorn's cult are addicted to this drug Sunlight, right? Sunlight, they just wanted to see the sun again. So Sunlight is the name of the Red Sash's drug. Uh, there isn't any more coming in because this clock got to where it's at and then um, the hive came in and just smashed everything. So. Um, and that kind of got handed to us on a platter, more so than driven by the clocks. But yeah, so this is all kind of on hold. Um, I'm going to make a roll today where the hive and the red sashes battle it out, and we'll see who rolls better. Um, I'm going to roll actual physical dice. Um, Gypsy, and this is regarding the distracted elf campaign uh, so yeah this is happening tonight at six o'clock Pacific um, and I am the GM for it uh, yeah so why don't we do this right now so basically if two factions are duking it out we're gonna roll we're gonna roll three dice for the red sashes and we're gonna roll uh, four dice for the hive because you just roll their tier um, and we're gonna see who gets a better roll uh, the red sashes just rolled two ones and a three uh, and the hive rolled a six so this was this was the hives roll and the red sashes just rolled a three and two ones so that means that the hive have the upper hand. Um, they've already accomplished this. Let me just do some more bookkeeping. Um, 
So essentially, the red sashes aren't able to open up a new channel. I think the hive is going to keep that all buttoned up. Um, and they're going to start working on their next big thing. And so let's take a look if we've got anything for the hive. So this is my big like NPC list, which I inherited from Sean, because uh, he was running, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Sean was running the game for season one, and then I am the GM now for season two. So my characters have all buggered off. Uh, Sean's brought in some characters, uh, and so now I get to be in charge of stuff. Um, and so for the hive, we've got currently controls the wholesale side of the drug trade in Duskfall, working to consolidate that power before taking on bigger fish. Um, so these, these are all my notes about them. So operate through various proxies and handlers. Top ranks are squeaky clean and have others who handle the rough elements. Uh, they operate via, like these are like locations that they have. So they have businesses, warehouses, storefronts. Um, Ashlyn is a hive handler who has the Firebirds as part of her portfolio. Um, she leads a double life as a dancer. This was all, this, like I rolled this stuff up in the tables and whatnot it was pretty fun so she she has a secret side where she cuts loose but i don't know if they'll ever find out about it um and then it's just some like notes for me about how i portrayed them i need to include like accents and other stuff just so that i can remember um and so maybe what the hive is doing will be a hook for the firebirds and that could be like a job that they get offered um but we need to decide what that is because um, right now we don't have a strong agenda for them i just noted that they wanted to take on bigger stuff so what we can do is look at the factions um and this is our like living document with all the updates so the crows and the lamp blacks are gone um the hive is tier four they have stronghold and they are friendly with the crew um, the red sashes are now negative one they're tier three stronghold so they're trying to the sashes are trying to make their play to grow up into being a tier four faction and the hive is trying to keep them in their place and now having done that the hive wants to start tangling with other big factions um, or maybe pick on some small ones is the other thing so maybe Maybe they're having conflict with some organi an organization like the Billhooks or the Grinders. Um, grinders, Billhooks, Tier 2s. Um, although that might be a little too small for them to be messing with. We're kind of running low on Tier 3 organizations um, that have been introduced, right? Because the only ones that we've actually seen in the game so far are the Hive, the Circle of Flame, very briefly, uh, Red Sashes, the Crows and the Lamp Blacks. Uh, the Wraiths have been around, Ulf Ironborn has been around. But the Wraiths and Ulf, so the Wraiths already work for the Hive. Uh, Ulf has kind of been subsumed into the, like, Workers' Revolt. Um, I mean, the Workers' Revolt could be a good place for us to go. Um, right, maybe the Hive starts meddling with the Workers' Revolt. I think that would be good, given that our crew is now set up in the docks, they're in a position to make strikes against them, and they have already gotten entangled with them a little bit, so I think that might be interesting. Yeah, I like I like I like that you can have nested stuff like this, like someone's pointing out in chat, where um both the firebirds and the wraiths work for the hive. The Hive likes the Firebirds, and probably likes the Wraiths, but the Wraiths hate the Firebirds. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you have, you know, vaguely aligned interests. And this came up in a previous session, too, where um, Arquo from the Wraiths was just like, yo, it doesn't matter that you beat me in a duel, because the Hive is going to think you're a bunch of idiots and stop giving a shit about you. Um, and we're going to take all your jobs. Uh... So that's definitely a thing. So maybe, and I think I think the collectivist revolution definitely messes with the hives jam because they were bringing through a lot of both legitimate and illicit trade through the docks, and now that the docks have been locked down, 
yeah, it totally makes sense for the hive to get involved. And this is also good because it it forces together different uh, interests within the crew. Um, so the hive's new project is going to be to um, stabilize the docks district using whatever means works best. Either placate the workers or use violence. Um, and so they're going to kind of try different stuff. As this clock progresses, it's going to go from, uh, in the early stages, we'll be assigning jobs to our various people that are about trying to like solve things diplomatically. Uh, and then towards the end, we'll start getting into violence. I mean, I say diplomatically, but like scare them into stopping and then like murder all of them. Um, and we'll keep it a six count. I think this is fine. Um, and so given that the hive rolled a six on their thing, I'm going to give them a couple pips. And then depending on how our crew does, this might advance this, or it might dial it back. It might shift things around. We'll see. And I mean, yeah, as a tier four organization, right, like they're involved in big stuff. Uh, like the revolution is pretty big. Uh, it's going to, it's on the verge of becoming a tier three organization, um, or sorry, a tier two stronghold, I guess. Um, assuming that they can complete their current job, which I'm going to do a tier roll for them because they've had a lot of time. So I'm going to roll two dice. Brutal. So things are holding up the revolution. They got a two and a three. Um, so that's only enough to get them one pip. So it might be that the collectivists come to the crew um, and try to offer them work as well. The Kinclave family has been in the background for a long time, uh, given that uh, Cricket is gone and she was the kind of main in for Andrel. But we'll see if they just finish up doing what they're doing. Yeah, so I got a five and a three for the Kinclave family. So they're gonna finish covering up their involvement uh, with the Foghounds. And then I think they're just gonna fade from our attention. This was basically like the last of their sketchy uh, activities following the death of Andrel's father um, and this was like baggage from that which is now resolved um, the spirit wardens have been hard at work so we're going to do a tier, tier roll for them with three dice and yeah Alex I think this is very much in line with the faction stuff from stars without number also a sandbox game so there's a four five and a six uh, for the spirit wardens. So the way I've been doing this is if they, if the number of pips they get, they can divide it among these two tasks. Um, but they actually get to complete both today. So this one of constructing stronger towers, this is mostly like a happening in the background for flavor kind of thing. Um, and the tidying up of crow's foot, I think it's really appropriate that this happen uh, as the crew is kind of leaving. Um, and the, so these kind of, yeah, these are like bigger picture things. The one that really matters directly to the crew is going to be this one. And this is where Cross, uh, Cross is going to come find them, essentially. Uh, maybe as a follow-up to their next operation that they run. Because I want to give them a chance to do something uh, on their own and not be stuck reacting again. Um, but both of these are done. Um, and I can just delete this whole thing, basically. I'll just add this to completed tasks. We'll think of something new for them to do uh, next time. I think they're gonna they're gonna chill for a minute. Um, and the circle of flame. 
acquiring their full set of Kotar artifacts. They got a 2, a 3, and a 5. Let's see if I can get the light on that. There we go. Um, so they're done. And some consequence of this will happen. Um, I have some open questions about this. So um, down at the bottom here, I have my questions. So these are things that I'm looking to answer. Uh, will the Hive find out that Rubix knows about Rorik's death? Because the leader of the Hive and Rorik were a thing together. Um, will the crew take side in the workers' result, revolt? This hasn't happened yet, but they're starting to get entangled with it. Um, and so I think, I think we want to push towards an answer to this question today. I really want to highlight this. Um, which faction silently backs the revolution? Well, we know it's not the Hive now. <laughs> um, we don't have an answer yet, but certainly not the Hive. Because um, they're going to try to tear it down, essentially. The idea of the Kotar artifacts and the Strange Towers fin finishing at the same time. What a coincidence. I mean, yeah, maybe they're related. Maybe the Circle of Flame has, like... I mean, certainly they're at the same tier as the Spirit Wardens, so one would imagine them being in conflict, but they might have agents inside the Spirit Wardens, stuff like that. I feel like um, I want to bring Vey back into things, because Rubik still owes Vey favors, and he hasn't ever made <laughs> made any efforts to deal with that. Uh, so Vey is going to call in favors, I think, and is going to be, at the very least, working with both the Circle of the Flame uh, and the and is a spirit warden, so he's going to have some uh, split loyalties, right? And then here we go. How will they lean on Rubik? Rubik's uh, something to do with COF remains to be seen. Um, so these aren't fully answered yet, so I'm leaving them in here. And who or what was Kotar? Right? It's uh, it's not fully. It's in. It's in the like little faction blurb for the Circle of Flame, um, but it's not very clearly defined. Kotar is either like an ancient sorcerer, a demon, or a hero who like fought demons, and it's not clear which. And I like leaving that as an open question for as long as possible. Uh, what gives our fellows paintings their magic? We don't know. Um, who's going to take the fall for the crew? We actually answered this. Crow takes. Or, well, took the fall. Rest in peace. Right, Crow got executed uh, for the crew's crimes. Um, I'm going to make a bit for answered questions because I think it's good to have these still. They're just historical now. If Rubik's leaves, who takes the reins? Um, when Rubik's was gone, Thorn sort of formed a cult. Like, this is still, this question is still open, but there's, like, some hints at what the answer might be. Um, because in the last session, Rubik's wasn't around. Uh, Thorn started getting all out of hand. Um, Birch started making plays against Thorn. Maybe Crude devours itself without Rubik's. It seems like there are lots of people at cross purposes within the crew, and then Rubik's is kind of the iron fist holding everything together. Um, so maybe without him, it will all kind of go to shit. Uh, will a faction help the birds out with the cops? Um, so who has offered to help them with this problem so far? Satara has offered. Um, Karis. Karis offered, sort of. 
uh, Karis was the blue coat who was watching, who was making sure that the operation in the um, in Tangletown was carried out. Um, I've decided that she's actually uh, a hive operative. Um, and so also, I mean, the hive, the hive absolutely offered, but Firebirds fucked up and lost the chance. So like various people have offered to help them out with the blue coats and the inspectors, but um, will anyone offer sacrifices sacrifices to Satara? Um, Thorn is forming a cult. Surely that will lead to some, right? But we still don't know. We haven't gotten to the point where there's been an actual ritual carried out. Um, I think I've got to push Elf to start a project to like make a ritual once she has a cult. Um, and then she can develop a ritual. We can go through the whole rules for making that, which are interesting. And then we'll see if the ritual requires some kind of sacrifice, and then we'll see what it is and whether or not Thorn is willing to go through it. Uh, hey, Retributor, how's it going? Um, so we got some new questions. We have answered one of them. Um, and I'm pretty sure, so I had paper notes originally, and I'm pretty sure I've fully transcribed Yeah, I transcribed all of my unanswered questions from this sheet. Um, but just a quick review. So we've got our cult heading now with Morlin, Caro, Frog, and Ogre. Um, we have Bricks. I think Bricks, I'm going to move into this area. He's going to end up here for sure uh, once the cult forms. Um, and I think he's been, like, peripherally involved. And that's part of why he was super into Thorn. Um, Thorn has now had a vision of these two characters. So there's Moraine Colburn, a.k.a. Grip, who is the... Uh, she's kind of, like, the main theorist for the revolution. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so reconciled spirits are behind communism in Duskfall. Uh, so Morlin is possessed uh, and is kind of this, like, unwilling... Like, I think she wanted to be strictly a theorist, but that the spirit that is possessing her is kind of pushing her into a position of leadership that she doesn't want and also, like, puppeteering her at times. Um... Drav uh, is the, like, militant arm of the revolution uh, and was the other person seen in the vision, the, like, small Eruvian. Uh, and they are just, like, a hardline murderer. You know, like, they have the potential to be the Stalin of this revolution. Um... So this is kind of the behind the scenes of what it's about, and we're, we're starting to see this. We've met some other characters who are involved, because there's bricks, uh, and now that the crew is in the docks, it's going to be more of a thing, um, and they're going to they're gonna continue to get entangled with the revolution, whether they like it or not. Um, they just need to pick a side. Uh, right, and so we have Arquo, who we mentioned earlier, uh, the duelist who fought with Rubix a couple of times. Um, these guys work for the Hive. Um, they previously worked for the Sashes, I think. But, in fact, yes, they did. Because that when we first dealt with them, they were working for the Sashes. But I had them switch sides, because, you know, they're smart. And they know who's going to win. Um, so we have our ghosts who are haunting the crew. All right, there's Belden, who came up again. Uh, he got... He got it. 
by Satara, but like, what does that mean? He's still around, but he has he has been transformed. Actually, I remember we narrated this. Has been um, affected by Satara somehow. Maybe he is part of a ghostly cult to Satara. Now, is that even a thing? Do ghosts hang out with demons? Maybe. Go or demons don't exist in the ghost field, but I, I don't think that that by any means limits them from being able to interact. Uh, it just means that they're very like separate things um, and so yeah Satara has in some way like infected him you know that's actually a cool angle for Satara to be taking is trying to like infiltrate the ghost world I need to add a section for Satara like she just needs her whole own this is like it has the potential to be a big thing we'll leave this as a as a ghost's question for now um and then there's jedwin a red sash ghosty but really i think jedwin got turned into a vampire uh essentially uh on accident um running around in her former colleagues body yeah hunting thorn thorn birch and rubix not hunting the crew hunting specifically those members of the crew because they were all there when it happened so she's going to hold them responsible um I'm going to do the fun thing of just having there be a new clock when they show up. Um, we'll add it here. Excuse me, roll 20, I want to make a thing. Jedwin's hunt. And this can be a six count clock with one pip on it. Yeah, and like having Satara be trying to make plays into the ghost stuff uh, is a nice lead-in to having the revolution be sponsored by ghosts. Um, I don't have them as their own section right now because it's it's like a couple of reconciled spirits are involved. I think the faction isn't especially interested yet, um, but if this little project by Moon, and I think there are probably a couple others, um, if this project takes off, then it would be something that the faction as a whole would embrace because it's a means of leveraging uh, people that are alive still for political power, which is really what the reconciled are all about. They're trying to they're trying to take over the government of Duskfall uh, and turn it into a like ghostocracy, um, which is an interesting plan. Um, <laughs> And so that's happening like very far in the background right now where the crew is not nearly big enough to be involved in that stuff but what they can be involved with is this like smaller thing um um right now the revolution is really unified the closest thing to factions within it would be the like the theorist camp versus the like we're gonna be violent and fuck shit up camp um, but the two right now are working together. Uh, Grip is this, like, unwilling figurehead of the revolution. Uh, and so she kind of represents this, like, very small but very important element of, like, dissent or critical self-evaluation within the organization. Um, but she isn't allowed to let a lot of that stuff out. Uh, the Reconciled seem to be pretty unified internally. Uh, and that they are listed in the 
Here, let me bring up the actual entry for them. Do, 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 where is my blades PDF? Here we go. So, it's like way down at the end here. Um, where are the reconciled? This is like too zoomed in, I can't see the whole page. Uh, let's see. I mean, the other thing is that Skurlock will come in if they keep messing around with Satara, I suppose. So the Unseen, the Wraiths, Spirit Wardens, the Red Sashes, the Reconciled. An association of ancient spirits who have not gone feral with the passage of time. Um, the Reconciled have possessed several important citizens in Duskfall. Their exact membership is not known. Um, situation. The Reconciled are very ancient and wise and see themselves as the rightful and just rulers that Duskfall needs. Um... A few of the city council members have become initiates in the Path of Echoes and will soon be vulnerable to possession by the Reconciled. These counselors are also high-ranking members of the Church of the Ecstasy of the Flesh, which will give the Reconciled an opportunity for infiltration into that organization as well. The Church of the Ecstasy of the Flesh is so not into having Dustfall be run by ghosts, but, you know, they're just an organization like any other, and they will get infiltrated and subverted by the Reconciled, if that all pans out. Um, obviously the spirit wardens aren't into it if they ever got wind of the fact that it was like possessed spirits that were you know starting this workers revolt they would come down on that really hard etc like the spirit wardens finding out about this stuff is really important which is why this clock matters in a whole bunch of different ways right like the more entangled the firebirds get with the revolution given that they now have Cross's attention, which is going to come up this next session, we'll see exactly how that pans out. Um, but if she sticks around, then that's going to become, it's going to become more of a thing where the like ghost cops are going to start realizing what's going on and then it, it's going to become a right mess. Um, as well as the fact that, you know, we've got a demon cult thing, which is like, yeah, multiple axes of the supernatural getting involved in the Docks District all at once. Um, and so, uh, I have my little to-do list here as well. So, uh, the Spirit Wardens have quarantined something, which is to say the old crew hideout has been totally locked down by the Spirit Wardens. Um, the inspectors did their raid, so that's resolved. Um, I want to offer them a score for the Circle of Flame, so now is a good time given that they have all the KOTOR artifacts. It might be that something needs to happen relating to that. Um, and I need to show the consequences of the Spirit Warden's stuff that they've been doing, right? This, the resolution of all of these things. Uh, we need to see that on, on screen. Um, there is still time for the collectivists to get involved uh, by way of entanglements and stuff in this session, but I think we're gonna... I don't know, we'll see if the crew have like specific things they wanna do, but I'm gonna try to offer them some profitable jobs, both for the hive and the circle of flame. Seems like those folks are the best positioned to give them work. Um, and so, given that our crew is uh, a crew of Bravos, um, they can do these kinds of jobs. So, battle, extortion, sabotage, or smash and grab. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, what among those are things that the Hive and the Circle of Flame would want? So I could see the Hive wanting some like extortion or battle stuff, given that they want to like quiet down the revolt. So maybe 
maybe our battle operation that they can offer is that they need the crew to like protect some warehouses or go rough up some people who are trying to take over some warehouses um yeah i mean like these are like they can do whatever they want but these are the this is the kind of work that i as the gm should be offering them right because this is what their crew is known for doing uh and what their crew is like seen as qualified to do and seen as being about um they can just go do social jobs all they want but it's like not in line with their crew type um and i want to be you know like these are these are hints to me as well as to the players of like do this kind of shit uh, so I'm going to try to stay on brand and offer them this stuff. Um, so yeah, there's like a pretty clear like battle type of work around just like fighting people in the docks on behalf of the hive. Um, for the Circle of Flame, uh, I think maybe it'll be like a smash and grab where... Um, someone has like absconded with one of the artifacts of Kotar and they need it retrieved. Um, and then it's just a matter of like sending in a bunch of tufts to get it. Um, and this could even be, so with the circle of flame, they're a really interesting faction. They've got some cool stuff going on. Let's look at them real quick. So, well, here's the hive very briefly. Um, you know, they are pretty straightforward. They want to. So they do avoid doing business with any occult or arcane groups. Um, they are into the Church of the Ecstasy of the Flesh. Interesting. Okay, so this is one that I hadn't included in my list of considerations previously. Um, but they are very much into the, like, mundane stuff. They don't want to mess around with the spiritual stuff. Um, so I think for now, it's not a big deal. Once once there's a cult to Satara within the crew, and if the Hive ever finds out about it, that's going to be costly to their, their rep with them. Um, and this is all the more reason for them to be opposed to to the revolution, although it would be funny if they were supporting it and then discovered later that it was a spirit thing and then they'd be all spooked. But, yeah. Um, so they're gonna get, they're gonna ask for the crew to punch up some dudes uh, in the warehouse area of the docks. Um, but then, what were we wanting to look at? We were wanting to look at the Circle of Flame. So, the leadership is the seven. One of whom is Raffello, right? So Raffello is one of the leaders of the Circle of the Flame, a visionary and obsessive painter. There is also Lady Drake, Elstera Avrathi, uh, Lady Penderin, Lord Mora, Madame Teslin, right, who has also come up, Madame Teslin. That was Cricket's vice purveyor or friend or something. Um, and then Harvale Brogan. Um, but the big thing that I really like is this. One of the seven is actually a demon in disguise. Is it Raffello? It could be Raffello, but maybe not. Um, I think the nobility mostly doesn't give a crap yet because the... Right now, the collectivist revolution is only a tier two weak organization. Like, no one's really taken big notice of them yet. They're doing a lot of instigating and stuff within the docks. And the. We decided the other day that the citizens of the docks are a, a different thing and they're doing. They're behaving differently. Um, they're also just a level two faction, so it's not like. It's not a huge problem yet. Um, no one, no one super influential or anything is uh, stirring the pot yet. So this is this is too small for big organizations to really take notice. The blue coats are going in and trying to deal with stuff, um, and the hive is going to get involved only because it involves 
the you know shipping trade, which is really important to them. Um, so, right, like their their default thing is to acquire all the ancient artifacts of Kotar, which they all they have them all now. But I imagine these seven all squabbling over who gets to have them or what they're going to do with them. One of the seven of them is a demon. And so depending on the nature of the Kotar artifacts, right, the demon is going to want specific things with them. We want to keep this open as long as possible as a question. Um, who among the seven is the demon? One day we'll find out, right? Because Kotar is a legendary sorcerer, demon, or hero who is mummified before the cataclysm. Um, the eye, the hand, and the heart of Kotar are said to possess great power for those who hold... Sorry, for those bold enough to risk their use. Um, so maybe we'll have it be... I'll have it be like the hand of Kotar. Um which someone has run off with. And so Raffello is going to offer a job against one of these other, one of the other seven. They're going to start squabbling now that they have this thing. Um, and so Raffello is going to try to hire the, uh, the Firebirds to go like rough up someone and take their stuff. Um, Which is going to be a really dangerous job because this is a tier three organization. But, yeah. <laughs> so that's a fun potential thing, right? Messing around with a tier three. The easier job will be the one the Hive gives because it'll be fighting a tier two organization. Our crew, the Firebirds, is still only tier one. So they're they're still always in situations where they're punching up um, but we'll see if they can pull it off they're also very close to going up um, although less close now that their wanted level went down when they were at wanted four they were effectively they were like two rep away from going up a tier but now that they're at wanted two they are four rep away from going up a tier so with a couple jobs today they could do it essentially it's in it's in reach um, it's always fun to give the crew a super powerful artifact they don't know how to use and see what happens yes absolutely um, and yeah whether in, having them go and get it right is then fun because Thorn of course will be tempted to use it um, Satara would want it, obviously, uh, and maybe that's something that she can sacrifice to Satara, and we can get an answer to our question, right, of like, will, will anyone offer sacrifices to Satara? Um, I feel like ultimately Thorn is going to give herself up to the demon, that's kind of... <laughs> the direction that Elf seems to be taking the character, so we'll see. We'll see what happens with that, but this is enough to run with for today, I think. Um, I'm going to brew on this whole Inspector's situation, um, as well as the Spirit Wardens, and see what they start working towards. I think also the events of this session might prompt action from these two groups. Okay, so that's, that's all that. Are there any outstanding notable things? Um, in terms of like what the characters have been up to, Rubik's has been away for a while. Um, this is his new vice purveyor. This is his friend. Cricket is gone for now anyways. Birch has been hunting around town for people with Celine, his friend. Um, looking for a demonologist of some kind. Uh, other members of the crew have been going and getting help from Melvier, who who hates Birch because Birch tortured him. Um, 
Grist is still Birch's vice purveyor, which is awesome. She's a fun character. Whip and Croak are gone. Ivan has a priestess who hates him and is friends with Eckerd as well. Uh, and goes to Vila the Herb Merchant for his vice. Ivan probably won't get played this session. I think uh, Jacob's going to play Rubik's. Um, and then we have Needle, Dr. Steven, uh, Milosh, um, Melvier. I don't need to have here. We already have another. Um, Thorn's friend Satara, yes. Quellen hasn't come up yet, but surely will soon enough. And the Hooded Proprietor has been all over the place. A crow. Rip. Crow is dead. Um, Brill never came up. Harker came up very briefly. Um, yeah. Clev and Wester haven't come up yet lately. We've kind of moved away from directly engaging with them. And now that they're out of crow's foot, I think the sashes are going to come up less and less. Um, for now. Until they start to expand. Oh god, yeah, the hand of Kotar. I gotta, I gotta hand it over. And other, other hand puns? No, there will be no hand puns. Just for that, we're changing it to the heart of Kotar. Just to avoid any... Well, no, I mean, I'm sure there could be heart puns, too. Uh, we don't know much about Cross yet, and I'm interested to expand this character, because she could be neat. Um, they... <laughs> probably a COF member. We'll just add that in there. And so we have we have a methodology for the circle of flame in terms of how they communicate, um, and so I need to remember that when I characterize how they try to give this job. Um, and I think Raffello kind of wants to keep his distance from Rubik's for a while yet, so he won't come and meet directly. It'll be they'll get like letters uh, with fancy seals on them um, delivered by like. A member of the ciphers or a gondolier or something um <laughs> this is a description i inherited from sean so yeah we'll see exactly what raffello's deal is um we need to add for pritchard has a vendetta against rubik's <laughs> like so many others and does fall All right, that's looking pretty good for prep. Um, so very briefly, an update for those of you who haven't been following this. So I'm working on Girl by Moonlight, my magical girl anime, Blades in the Dark, Blades in the Dark hack. <sighs> Got through it. Um, this is kind of where I'm at right now. Uh, nearly at a happy point with character sheet stuff um there are a couple more elements that i need to work into the layout um all right i have my little to-do list here um i think for this i've decided i don't really, really want this so probably cut uh we're not going to have Equipment rules, I don't think. I think we're going to get rid of that entirely. Fiction, interrogation, section, content, and placement is done. Um, this remains to be done. Deal with recovery, armor placement, look, and adjust content. So, we just need recovery clock. Assuming we're using a clock, which is the other kind of open question. Um, make some actual moves for this playbook and fill them in. Yeah, we did that. There aren't a lot, but there are some. Darkest self section. This is important. I think this is probably going to end up going in the bottom right. Um, uh, 
darkness. Um, oops. And I think this will probably be like this corner, kind of like that. Yeah, I feel like it's just a little bit, like it makes, obviously it makes sense in blades because like doing heists and, and f you know, the period and everything, like all the like combat stuff, it all, it all makes lots of sense to have gear. But you can see even in that, like even in blades, there are some of the playbooks where it's like the gear is kind of, um, like they get the generic options, which are, yeah, sure, always great. And then their specific stuff is like, you get a bottle of whiskey, you know, like I'm not saying it's a weak choice, but just that, um, it's like, even in that game, some of the playbooks don't really need like equipment, equipment, uh, and I just, I don't, I don't see it being enough of a genre element for uh, Magical Girl stuff. Um, there, there's like a very narrow subset where the like gear kind of matters, um, but I, I want to handle it in a slightly different way. I either want to put it as like a crew advance, where it's like everyone in the crew gets uh, an item of you know like part of a set of items and they each get assigned one and it does a thing and they're and they are unique and each each pc gets one um an option like that uh which you know could could do like a crystal gems kind of a thing or like a mystical knights ray earth kind of thing uh and then beyond that i don't really see the place of gear in the game so then we can make more room for other more personal stuff on the on the playbook um and we have a couple of gaps uh in the layout that we need to account for so like one is this top corner what goes here because uh, this was uh coin and stash in the old playbooks in the blades playbooks um so we might want to like move some stuff around in order to place things correctly i corners are weird like they're a nice place to put very particular types of elements. Um, I don't know if I want to like just take everything and move it up uh, necessarily. I kind of like keeping the moves and the actions kind of at a level here. So then you want like some small element to go in the corner. Um, but we'll see what that is. Maybe I move this like pushing yourself stuff up there. Although it's nice to have it follow this stuff. Um, I like having the gather information stuff down here as part of this whole like rolling things section as like a like a resolution of mechanics uh column i feel like is kind of nice uh yeah so we'll figure out something to go there down the line um we've got armor we can fit recovery in here we've got stress we don't have trauma instead we have promises I'm of half a mind to make promises a list like trauma is. I'm still figuring out exactly what the deal is with promises. Essentially, I want them to be like inter-character bond type things, um, but things that also reflect. Uh, so I want them to reflect the situation, right? And be involved with the other characters. And I want them to uh, reflect the characters like role, uh, both their capital R role or their playbook. Um, so I gotta figure out exactly how we wanna present those. For now, it's just a, like a, it'll be like a sentence that you write out. Um, hmm, player agenda principles, I like that. I'm, I think that is a smart suggestion. Player agenda section, question mark? Yeah, I think that's a really reasonable thing to have because, like, on the Blades sheets, there's like a GM reference thing, and it includes the GM principles, right? Like, and your goals. Having a section, why do you know why not have a section like this for the other players? Because um, you know this this is the equivalent of their actions that they all have ratings in, right? Of the like, you know, 
skirmish, a tune, etc. Right? That's that's the equivalent for this. Um, there's a lot more rule stuff on the GM sheet because they the GM has the pressure of like being the interpreter adjudicator of the rules in a blades style game so people catching typos and stuff excellent i have a crack team of editors um so yeah like why not why not have a principles or goals section for players i think that's very reasonable um yes you can always ask uh, so I'm starting to figure out some identity stuff for the Guardian um, as being a very like paladin-y kind of playbook. Um, so they have the hound move where they can reduce the penalties from harm. Uh, they have kind of like the body, something similar to the bodyguard move uh, slash armor uh, from uh, the cutter kind of, um, and then something similar to like a leech move here with the giving extra die to injury recovery. However, injury recovery is different in my game because it's going to be you don't recover your own stuff, you can only help other people recover. Uh, and so the Guardian is going to be really good at that, but they also need other people to help them recover when they're soaking lots of damage. Um, so they have to, you know, find that where they can. Um, the other thing I could do is actually I really like this okay rather than getting an additional die when you help someone recover from injury you also recover so essentially when they help someone else recover they get to recover for free which is very strong, but whatever. We're just gonna do it. We're just gonna do it. I think that is cool. Um, I can scale it back to like, you recover as if you hit it on the lowest roll. So you get like one, one slice for free uh, whenever you help someone. <laughs> Need the crow crate on send to allow group recover. I mean, there probably will be some stuff like that. Um, Yeah, I think I think I like that flavor because then it's about like gathering. You know, it's another way that we can show the characters pulling strength from working together. Um, so I need to I need to come up with another couple. Sorry, punching my microphone. Um, need to come up with a couple more moves. I think um, I'm still kind of on the fence about whether or not I want to have transcendent moves be separated by playbook, I think I'm probably going to need to. Um, but I want to at least have five uh, core playbook moves. And so these are going to just span like all situations. The transcendent moves are essentially like battle moves. Um, whereas I want there to be a number of like downtime oriented moves. We're just going to put this over here for now because it's really getting in the way. Um, in terms of what's going to go here, I can't remember what it is, but there was something I had planned to go here. I'm sure it will come to me. It might be that our darkness, or like darkest self descriptor, descriptor goes in here. Um, but yeah, I want to, I want to have every playbook have some, at least one or two moves like this one, where they're about like downtime stuff and how the characters collaborate to get by. Um, <clears throat> because this game is going to have a very different angling on the whole like pressure cooker thing. Blades Blades really puts you in the like stress pressure cooker alone. It like it divides the characters for that where everyone has a different vice um or at least generally. You'll see like people having different vices. They don't hang out with each other 
outside of work, right? They're like, cool, we did the job, and now I'm gonna go be alone and do this weird thing that I do that only I wanna do. Um, and then, and then, you know, that's how I recenter and recover. And also like, has room for like entanglements. Like I go off and kind of fuck everyone else over by having bad things happen to me because of my selfish pursuit of this thing. Um, I'm trying to flip a lot of that stuff. So it all is going to work a little bit differently. Our, our equivalent kind of like you always have to do it thing is obligation which gains you stress um and then you have to like actively do downtime stuff to spend time with people and recover stress that way so yeah i want to encourage a lot of downtime scenes where it's like people describing their characters spending time together um so yeah like vice has been kind of split up uh, into um, obligation, which is the, like, you always have to do it every downtime or, like, you know, because, like, we don't have trauma, so things kind of, the mechanics kind of get, like, dissolved into other areas. So, yeah, obligation is kind of one part of Vice, that, like, uh, pacing kind of function that Vice serves, where it's, like, you do this every every time there's downtime or whatever, or, like, at a regular interval so we have obligation for that um which isn't going to happen every downtime but it's going to happen at least once per like cycle you're going to have to do your obligation um and then which i mean i guess that might actually end up being the same we'll see uh so you go to your obligation your obligation is generally going to give you some stress and then you kind of have to mitigate that so it's it's setting the pace in a different way um because also I didn't want to have like entanglements and stuff like that working the same way. Um, so every single downtime action, like the recovery one and all this kind of stuff, um, are going to be like, like I can't heal my own wounds, I can heal your wounds and then you have to heal my wounds. Like they're gonna be more about doing things for other people um, rather than doing things selfishly. Um, and so that is how I'm going to just like force the players to do stuff together. Um, and yeah, some of those are going to, and they're going to give opportunities for people to hit their other XP triggers, right? To like, like in downtime, we are going to do this stuff I'm drawing with white. It's not very helpful. Let's draw with red. Right, we're going to be able to do this bit of expressing your beliefs, strives, goal, or background. Um, and you're going to maybe be able to re fulfill the requirements of your promise, if your promise is about like protecting your friends or helping heal people or what have you. Um, so there are opportunities for the players to pursue these kind of XP triggers directly. Um, and yeah, you can like help your best friend get a date or whatever, right? They're gonna be, they're gonna all be involving the other players. And yeah, obviously you you're gonna generate links in downtime as well. Um, they're, Anytime you roll like a crit on doing any of these other things, like helping someone heal or whatever, you'll get links for free, and then there will be ways that you can pursue getting links um, is the plan right now. And links are like a resource that you want to build up. Um, and we'll we'll see how that economy plays out, but there, you know, there are gonna be various ways that you get these. Um, and these are credits that you spend uh, in the fighting phase to get stuff and then they all kind of I'm not sure if they all reset or not uh, from episode to episode I think they probably will I don't like the idea of people banking a shitload of them um, or being overly precious with them I want to encourage people to spend them and also I don't want to I want to be pretty stingy with them <laughs> so we'll see uh, and I mean, I say force the players, it's not like they're going to feel bad about doing this stuff. 
hopefully. That's the idea, right? It's to make them, it's to give them good reasons to do it uh, because, you know, of the mechanics, but then the reason that you as the designer are, are wanting them to do that is for this other thing, which is to get an experience. Yeah, I don't, I don't like that aspect of, uh, I don't want to let players just like sit on resources forever. Um, I want to encourage a more fluid economy um, in terms of links and stuff like that. Uh, also, it my other like bullshit get out of this uh, answer is that we are evoking an episodic format <laughs> where at the end of the episode, very little carries forward. And then we go on to the new episode and it's a new day and we just start all over. Um, we'll see. We'll see how that works out in play. I'm. I'm not committing to. You know. All. All this is changeable. Okay. But anyways, this is. This is where I'm at right now with this. For those that are curious, um, I'm gonna keep working on it throughout the week and do a bigger dev session on Friday. Um, I didn't get as much time to work on this this morning as I was hoping for. I kind of just like faffed about and tried to make up a bunch of moves, scrap them all, and ended up only liking. Uh, this recovery one, um, which we even made a small edit to just now. So uh, that's where I'm at. I'm going to take a little break uh, before the show, which starts in about an hour. Um, so that's Blades in the Dark on Distracted Elf's channel. Uh, I highly recommend you come check it out. Um, we were going through, that's what we were doing all the prep for just now. Um, so you can check that out uh, at six o'clock. Pacific on Distracted Elf, uh, twitch.tv slash Distracted Elf. Come watch it. Uh, you probably already know where to find me, so I won't bother doing a shout out of myself. But I'll see you all in an hour, hopefully. Bye, friends.